This is In Character. I'm your host, Gerard Robinson, Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies in Culture Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Sarah, who was part of a larger conversation that I had with other teachers to talk about the importance of resiliency. And she's joined us today to talk about that, but also to give us an opportunity to know more about her, uh, her work, who she is, and all the great things she's done. So with that, welcome, Sarah. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So before everyone gets a chance to watch the wonderful video that you're in to talk about resiliency, tell us who's Sarah. Who is she? What does she do? And how does she end up on a, in a place like this? Well, I, I love this question. It's, it's, you know, a huge question. Um, and that's kind of why I love it, which probably says a lot about me, um, that I'm the, I am a kind of person who loves big questions, to be honest with you. Um, but I also am a teacher. Um, I'm in the classroom. So I just started my 23rd year as a high school English teacher, just outside of Des Moines, Iowa and Johnston. Um, I am a hybrid teacher. So um, I teach part of the time. And then the other part of the time, I um, work with the National Teacher of the Year program. Um, and then I work with teachers um, and education organizations around the country in lots of different capacities. Uh, so, you know, certainly that identification as a classroom teacher is incredibly central to my sense of self. Um, and being a teacher is really central to my sense of self. Um, of course, bigger than that probably though is, not probably, but is. Um, I'm also a mom of three. So I have a 16 year old, a 14 year old and a 10 year old. Uh, so I, you know, I think um, when I think about who I am, I am a mom and I'm a teacher and I'm a learner and I'm a reader and I'm a writer and I'm a runner and I'm a music lover and I'm a hiker and um, you know a person just kind of compelled to see the best in others in this world. So 20 plus years in the profession you're in Iowa um, some people call it flyover country I've had a chance to go there twice beautiful place. It is. Are you from Iowa originally and if not what attracts you to that state? I am actually, I am a complete product of the Iowa school system, which I take great pride in. Um, yeah, I was born and raised here in the state. Um, I, got, I, I got my first job here. I've been mentored by teachers um, here in Iowa. Um, my degrees are from university here in Iowa. Um, so I, I, I'm really proud to be an Iowan. Um, there has always been a sense of the importance of public education in our state. Um, and I think that sense of how crucial it is to create a public education system um, that, is, that is for everyone um, is, is just been part of how I was raised. Uh, my mom is, was a career teacher as well, and I come from a long line of teachers. So and a long line of Iowans. Uh, so that's certainly central um, to who I am. English. Uh, yeah. There were other subjects, but you said, I'm gonna become an English teacher. Talk to us about that, particularly with high school students. And there's always debates over whether we're doing a good enough job and inculcating the values that English can tell us, also English literature, but English in, in particular. So talk to us about uh, what it's like uh, in, in that world. So I, I I feel so um, fortunate to be able to teach in a content area that I think is is so rich with humanity. Um, you know, I, I really do think that at the core of, of teaching, um, we find some of the most human work there is. And that human work um, cannot be rushed. Um, it is truly about one person to another person, one person at a time. And so I have found um, that my content area is a wonderful conduit for the humanity that I think has to happen in this profession. Um, but I also, you know, I also love language. Um, I love literature um, and 
I am a, I, I, I gave a TED talk and I, and it was, the title was um, about being a story holder. It mm. wasn't about being a storyteller. It was about being a story holder. And um, I think that, that being an English teacher um, has taught me how to hold stories. Um, and it's taught me how to listen. It's taught me how to think. Um, and it's taught me about the importance of complexity and seeing underneath the surface. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I wouldn't teach anything else. You talked about uh, humanity and we need more of that today, not only in our general conversations about life, but also in politics. And people overlook the fact that the humanities for a really long time have played a central role in helping build a whole person, which was part of the resiliency uh, conversation we had. How do you practice resiliency as a teacher um, to students, but also how do you keep yourself resilient uh, in, uh, in difficult times like this? Well, you know, for me, I think the, the, the fundamental way to stay resilient is to make mistakes. Mm. So if we don't make mistakes, if we aren't vulnerable, if we aren't human, um, we're not practicing resiliency, you know, we're, we're doing the antithesis of it. We are trying to avoid having to be resilient, I think. Um, and, you know, I think there certainly is a difference between um, putting yourself in, in the way of a challenge so that you kind of deliberately practice that sense of resiliency um, and then having those things thrust upon you. And when they are thrust upon you, um, uh, certainly, I'm sure that's, you know, that's how so many of us feel right now. We didn't ask for the year 2020, um, but, it, but it showed up. Um, and so I, I think that, that for me, um, it requires a lot of centering. Um, it requires um, a lot of connection to the things that matter most to me and the people that matter most to me. Um, and it also, it, it really, it does come back to the teaching for me. I have to tell you, it comes back to the teaching. Um, I feel like my best self when I am teaching. And even if I'm not always in a conventional classroom, right? So sometimes I'm, uh, you know, sometimes I'm with teachers in an auditorium and sometimes I'm working with teachers virtually and things like that. But when I'm in that mindset of teaching, um, I remember who I am. And so I think that really uh, plays an important role in fostering the, that, you know, that quality of being resilient. You talked about the hybrid lifestyle that you have right now professionally. Talk to us about the other side of the hybrid that's outside of the classroom. Uh, so, I mean, I still feel like a teacher, to be honest. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I certainly, I, I tell people my classroom is a lot larger, um, but, <laughs> but I, but I certainly feel like a teacher in that, in that regard as well. Um, but really what that work is, um, is it is this wonderful opportunity for me to um, help teachers um, see themselves um, differently, to see themselves as leaders. So sometimes the work is very specifically focused around teacher leadership. Um, and a lot of times it's focused around teachers and their own growth. Um, and so I really value the, the opportunity to, um, to help teachers open up their practice um, and again, you know, this, this, is the, this is the great combination between having a classroom and being willing to be imperfect in it <laughs> and making mistakes in my classroom and then being able to go, you know, to a school across the country and say, and last week when I tried this and it didn't go so well, this is how I figured it out. And so I, I certainly, when I, whenever I'm working with teachers um, and organizations, I see myself not as a person with all of the answers, but truly as the same kind of lead learner that I strive to be in my conventional classroom. You know, the person who's willing to try something different or new and make the mistake and then talk about how I struggled through it and talk about how I learned from it and how I got better because of it. I think that's really the crux of our growth, you know? And I appreciate you opening up 
yourself to us because we think that all of our teachers are perfect. We think, of course, they make no mistakes. They're always in the school building. We arrive, they're there. They don't shop. They don't have another life. They're always there for us. They don't go to the grocery store. No, they're always there. Because of the great work you do, because you say, you know what, uh, I'm an imperfect being who's working toward doing something different. I am human. I am an educator. There were a number of people who said, you know what, we think you should be recognized for your award. And so I won't give a spoiler alert, but talk to us because many people in Iowa, really across the country may never get a chance to meet you in person. But talk to us about the day someone said, I think we're going to nominate you for something all the way to the point where you were in a, uh, a capital city, let's just say, and someone right. announced your name. Walk us through that process. It's a story. It's a story, right? So, so I, I'm in my kitchen um, making, I remember this, I'm in my kitchen making spaghetti um, for my three young children. And I am looking at the mail and I open up this piece of mail and I remember it was in March and which is a crazy right after spring break so i've got all of these seniors it's a so that that time between spring break and the end of the year when you got a bunch of seniors you don't mess around with that period of time right because they all got to graduate yep. um and so i opened this letter and it says you've been nominated for the iowa teacher of the year and i was like oh that's great but i have no time for this <laughs> so i just put it aside i'm like there's no time i got to get these kids graduated so i get through the end of the school year um and i open the letter back up and i take a look at it and um and i realized the application was due and i don't know i think it was like three or four weeks and i looked at some of the essay questions and i thought you know i've got some things i would really like to say about teaching and learning i don't think i'm teacher of the year quality but I'm gonna take some time. I'm gonna take the next two weeks and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna figure out what I have to say about this. Um, so I did that and in the process, you have to get some letters of recommendation, of course. And so I wanted to take a different approach to that and kind of create these community letters from different communities of people that I had worked with. And so one of them was a community of students. And um, in that process, one of my former students <laughs> said, finally, finally we have been waiting for you to say something and i said what are you talking about and he said you don't get it like we all got together after we graduated we got together and we nominated you for this award and we've been waiting for you to say something because we didn't want to be the ones to tell you that we nominated you and so they had been waiting for me it was really sweet um and as it would happen um i ended up being selected as the iowa teacher of the year and then um, found out later that I was um, a finalist for the National Teacher of the Year. So there's a State Teacher of the Year from each state, um, the territories as well, and um, went to Washington, D.C. for a three-day interview that felt a little bit more like kind of a reality, you know, thing where you have all of these events. Like there were all of these events. There were press conference and TV interviews and um you know traditional interviews and presentations all kinds of things and um went through that process and just felt so incredibly fortunate that i had had this chance to spend three days geeking out about teaching and learning with all of these people who are just as big of geeks about it as i was um and i was completely floored um, when I found out that I had been selected as the National Teacher of the Year. And so um, it, was, it was a really, you know, of course, really special time. My youngest at the time was four months old when President Obama gave me the award in the Rose Garden. Um, and that was, you know, of course, incredibly special. Um, and it's a wonderful honor, but to be honest with you, it's a really big job. So um, you're pulled out of the classroom for the year. That year alone, I did something like 250 talks. I was in 39 of the states, a um, couple different countries. And, you know, you serve as ambassador of education for the United States. And um, I was scared almost every day. Um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was okay. Talk about resilience, right? Um, and, you know, at the end of that experience, um, I felt more compelled than ever to make my way to the classroom and become a better teacher. 
because I was so um, just overwhelmed by the incredible educators that I met um, throughout that year that I, I really felt like the best way to honor all of the work that I had seen them do was to do my own work better. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since, get better. That was 2010? That was 2010, decade ago. Wow. And you returned back to school and you're excited. Uh, you bringing in some things you didn't have before. Well, as we end up, and that was a wonderful story, what do you want to share with all of us who are watching and listening as it relates to what we can do to support uh, you as an educator, but just the education profession in, in general? Because you, you touch teachers across state lines. You've had a chance to you know, go overseas. You've seen high-level policy, local. A lot of us don't get a chance to do that. What can we do from a civil society approach to be helpful? You know, I, I think one of the biggest things is um, to be curious. Uh, I, I think to be curious to ask teachers what their experiences are like um, and, and ask without expectation of, of a certain kind of answer, right? Um, you know, you know, I, I love that that saying, you know, seek to be seek to understand before you seek to be understood. And um, I think that there's a lot that that people do not understand about what happens in in classrooms. I don't think that like largely as communities or as a society, we, we understand the complexity of the work that teachers do every day. And um, and that's what I most want. Um, I most want those conversations. I most want people to be genuinely curious um, and, um, and to be able to start to understand um, how we can work together because, you know, there isn't a panacea. There's not one answer um, because communities are different and every community has to find its own way to contend with their own realities. And so I think the, you know, like the hope that there would be one single answer um, might, might undermine all of the work, you know, um, but we can do it at a community level. And I think that's really, really, really important. I like the word uh, curious, because uh, there's a juxtaposition. On one side, we say curiosity actually killed the cat. Yeah. And then on the other side, it worked really well for a monkey named George. Right. Uh, curious George. And so <laughs> right. depends on which side you go. Well, yeah. Sarah, I want to thank you for taking time on In Culture to share you. your story with us. As you say, you are a story holder. Yeah, a yeah. story holder. And uh, also sharing it by telling us as well. So thank you again for your time. Look forward to uh, more conversations. And thank you for all the work you do for your students at Iowa, but also the profession nationwide. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.